This song was one that I'd initially heard a few years ago, when I'd more or less had it pop up in the recommended portion of a playlist of mine completely on accident. I was immediately gripped by the lyrics and stopped what I was doing so that I could translate them more thoroughly. And what I found was a disturbing, fast-paced translation of one of Asia's greatest tragedies. As the song starts out, the singer can be heard chanting floridly about sealing up emotions and secrets in what is known as a coin locker. The simple device is widely used in both Japan and China. Most often, they're seen at train stations so that travelers have a quick, convenient space to store things. And in this song, from sentence one, a picture is painted of a series of lockers containing important, non-tangible items that the singer is locking away. The second sentence of the song, however, shows us that that might not be the case entirely, because these lyrics can be heard. Bundling up the fruit of our love, too, and in the locker it goes. The next line shows the singer struggling to maintain her happiness in the wake of a tragedy that she's just committed. She goes on to talk about how busy she is, how she doesn't have time to waste, and how she desires to rid herself of unneeded burdens. If you haven't already begun to put things together, I'll paint the picture for you with a bit more clarity. The singer is describing her tumultuous pregnancy, which, in the end, is far too much for her to handle on her own. So, in a panic, she bundles up her newborn baby, locks the child inside a coin locker, and does her best to forget about what she's done. Throughout the rest of the song, she also locks away her regret her remorse, her guilt, and anguish, hoping they'll simply evaporate and she won't have to deal with them anymore. The chorus becomes a haunting lament as she says goodbye to the baby she refused to let live, apologizing, but yet justifying her actions by restating that she wasn't ready to raise a child. When the bridge hits, the feeling becomes even more desperate as the singer describes the state of her child, quoting, stained with filth unprotected and inside. I waited and waited, but in the end, when I got cold feet, it was a little too late. I couldn't make it. That's when we're made aware of the haunting realization that the singer did, at some point, decide to go back for her child, but in the end, wasn't quick enough to save it. A downright horrifying and extremely saddening story from verse one until the very final note. After the bridge, we're treated to a sort of intermission where you can hear multiple sounds congealing together. One of them, to me, sounds like the distorted wail of a siren, possibly indicating that law enforcement was involved at some point during the singer's tragic story. As the chorus evolves, we hear the singer cry, escaping from all pains, you fled into the world of dreams. As you dozed off with a smile on your lips, your body has now gone cold. And the last sound we ever hear is a locker door slamming shut. While this song is disturbing, haunting, and downright horrifying in nature, nothing can even begin to compare to its real-life connection. In Japan and China, there is an abuse phenomenon that has been practiced by the populace for a disturbingly long time. Coin-operated locker babies are children that have been abandoned in coin lockers across Japan and China, neglected by their parents and left there for dead. 
Our real-life story takes place in Tokyo, Japan, and involves a mother by the name of Emiri Suzaki. She willingly turned herself over to the police and confessed that she'd stored the body of her baby in a coin locker at Tokyo Station for four to five years. Officers, upon inspection of the station's lockers, did in fact find the body of Suzaki's child, wrapped in a plastic bag and in a progressively decaying state. Suzaki had reportedly stored her dead child there for many, many years, paying the locker storage throughout that time to keep her secret from ever being discovered. And, while Suzaki claims that the child was dead upon birth, police are still investigating the exact cause of death. To this day, circumstances are still completely unclear. While this story has a similar tone, it's not disclosed whether Suzaki's child was actually alive, or at least somewhat alive, upon entering the coin locker. But police had mild suspicion that there was some sort of foul play at hand, given that Suzaki's fear of being found out by another family member was actually what eventually led her to confess to what had happened. Her reported story then seemed to clear her from being held completely liable by law. So, her accountability for what would have been a crime was never fully finalized. Sadly, for many other children, like Suzaki's child, their death is sealed inside a locker, and the last scene that they ever see is painted in darkness. Unfortunately, there are countless other accounts of children perishing inside coin lockers than one can actually even come to terms with knowing about. Even with a brief search of the internet, the cases that come to light are haunting and tragic. There are an assortment of reasons as to why parents make the horrifying decision to abandon their child and leave them for death to claim. I have to force myself to look at this song as a means of spreading awareness about a terrible trend that has become far too common in both China and Japan. This song not only explains the horror that the child experiences, but the confusion, guilt, and utter helplessness that the parent feels after making such a detrimental decision. It gives us a wonderful picture of both viewpoints and forces us to consider not only the angle of the abused, but the meaning behind the abuser's actions. Does that make it right? Absolutely not. But when we widen our perspectives, it becomes easier to treat issues like this so that they don't continue to happen on repeat. Currently, Japan and China are both working on cracking down on this unfortunate trend with preventative measures. And I sorely hope that they're successful so that one day, this song loses its relevance and the practice is sealed away in history instead of forced into the news headlines of present society. This is one of those songs that right out of the gate paints a dismal picture while maintaining a carefree, pleasant sounding melody. The singer bewails the life of a child simply termed as the useless or worthless child. But even with that sort of a title, the singer seems to reflect affectionately on the child's very existence. As the song goes on, we will soon discover why. At the beginning of the song, the useless child is described as a failure who can't study, exercise, or even speak very much at all. Then we're told that the child is also destitute, dense, and dirty, lacking the ability or know-how to attend to any form of self-care or self-betterment. And this is when we start to realize just how dependent this child is on its caretaker, the singer. Someone who fell in love with the child sobbing and vowed to care for him no matter what. The song goes on to paint a picture of the child's state, adding the adjectives germy, crybaby, and even scaredy cat, letting us know just what sort of a member of society that this child actually is. But even despite that, the singer describes just how connected they are, singing together, dancing together, and even sleeping together pursuing their own sort of peace in the face of their trials. 
Then, the singer continues to tell us just how dire the situation is, claiming that the child would be all but dead without her intervention, and that somehow she's the only one who can save the child from his habits and shortcomings. However, halfway through the song, we get a tone change as the child grows into an older, less manageable version of himself. The visuals showing us just how outmatched our singer has become. She goes on to describe him then as a monster, a ghost, and even an invisible human, changing her tone as she describes what I tend to think must be the child reaching some form of adolescence. She continues to explain how the now older child refuses to care for himself, go out, interact, or even treat her kindly as he may have done before. But even so, the singer reminds us that time continues on, regardless of their trials. And, as you might have thought, things do eventually get worse. In a carefree tone, the singer laments, Now it's too late, you're mentally retarded. Which connects the beginning of the song with the entirety of its content, showing us just why it is that this child is called useless. Having a possible mental disability, or even being otherwise mentally underdeveloped in some sort of way. And, while that may have been the case from verse 1, it's now, the time has passed and things haven't changed, that this singer seems to finally accept what had actually been all along. Even so, her restrictive hold on the child's life doesn't change. She even states, you belong to me, at one point further stressing the child's dependency even now that he's grown much older. This is when things change entirely for the singer, and her relationship with what was once a helpless child, when the dependent child grows into his own and begins to revolt against his caregiver, her affections seem to shift. It's explained then that he left her side, running away, and that after such a long time, the singer can't even imagine being without him. It's unclear whether the child hurt himself or the singer in trying to bring him back somehow caused him harm, but I'm more inclined to go with the latter, and that's because, afterwards, the singer states, before I realized it, that child was covered in wounds, but then relays that he fled from her, running away from her for reasons that aren't necessarily expounded upon. But. If this line is referring to abuse, then I believe he'd have every reason to have run away after his caretaker did the unthinkable. And to further confirm this theory, the chorus is reintroduced, only this time the lyrics have changed. Instead of saying, you're a useless child, each verse is changed to focus on the singer versus the child, instead featuring her singing about herself, saying, I'm a useless child. It's then made aware that the singer has finally realized that she's just as hopeless as the child she tried to change. When doing research for this project, I filed through a handful of child neglect cases before arriving on one that I thought fit this song's outlined story the best. And it's the story of a girl named Jeannie Wiley, a feral child who was discovered at age 13 by a social worker. A girl who had been confined to a small room, often tied up and kept from any sustained interaction with her parents for the entirety of her life. Without the ability to speak, socialize, understand human communication, or care for herself, Jeannie was taken in by social services and her parents, who neglected her, were eventually to be charged with abuse. Initially, many psychologists were extremely interested in her case and the National Institution of Mental Health provided funding for a team whose main focus would be to chart scientific research regarding Jeannie's case and the eventual progress she would make as her case would unfold. Jeannie soon became fairly attached to multiple members of the team after long, grueling days spent working together on various tasks. And, while she did make progress early on in some areas, her language abilities remained stuck at the level of about a one-year-old. Despite learning self-care habits, she continued to need increased assistance from the team caring for her, becoming dependent on them to function in the world even as she steadily grew older. 
It was at this point in her life that she occasionally spent time at one of her teacher's homes. However, that teacher became overly protective and began filtering who could see her or even interact with her. The teacher, whose last name was Butler, was painted as a villain for hoarding Jeannie's case to herself, concealing any progress they'd achieved and refusing to allow others to assist her in any way. Eventually, Jeannie was removed from Butler's care and placed with a psychologist who sheltered her for about four years. In that time, she began to show small improvements, but still lacked the overall ability to move forward fully from certain issues. When funds began to dwindle and Jeannie's team was disbanded, she was put through a series of foster families as she continued to age. At one point, her birth mother, who had been cleared from certain charges, was given care of her but she quickly bowed out because the task was far too difficult. Then, Jeannie was moved through a handful of other foster homes in which she was often abused and neglected time and time again. And due to this, she began to regress. She stopped talking and communicating at all, and most of the progress that she'd made was reversed as tragedy erased her accomplishments one by one. I find that her story, while it doesn't necessarily line up directly with the story in the song, has many startling similarities. Just like I suspect that the useless child had some sort of mental disability or inadequacy, Jeannie was also in a horrid mental state after years of repeated abuse. And, just like the child in the song, she grew up around caring people who eventually became abusive when she didn't perform or show further progress. In fact, Butler reminded me of the singer in the song, shielding Jeannie from outside influence and fostering a dependent relationship with her. Then, later on, other foster families would bring the abuse portion of the song to light as they further traumatized the already agonized child, abusing her when she had trouble coping or didn't do as told. With Jeannie's inability to properly rebel or speak out against such treatment, her options were extremely limited. And when she had attempted to move away or leave her terrifying situation, she was repeatedly restricted from doing so. Just like the useless child, Jeannie wasn't at fault for her inability, but still seemed to have to pay the ultimate price for the issues she was born into. The tragedy of Jeannie's case correlates well to that of the useless child in Kikuo's song. Even though it's not completely similar, the story is eerily close. Those who take advantage of the mentally disabled, monopolize them, continually confuse them, or even abuse them, are truly detestable. And, unlike those in Jeannie's story, the singer of the song Useless Child seems to realize that by the end of the unfortunate melody. No longer does she sing, you're a useless child, but instead, I'm a useless child. A flaw of humanity that begs the question, who are we to judge those that we feel are beneath us? I'm thankful that this song comes full circle, the singer realizing that she's not above her young charge in any way, and that by repeating trauma, she's not solving the situation or fixing it, but she's making it worse. Today, Jeannie still lives with a foster family somewhere in California. However, her present condition is unknown, and even private investigators, who have been hired to look into her case again, have failed to ascertain whether she's happy or even content with her current situation. But, after all she's been through, I sorely hope that that's the case, and that somehow she's found peace. Kalalini is a song that right out of the gate drops you into a seldom understood experience, putting you front and center as a living nightmare unfolds. As the story begins, you follow the singer as she describes her position on the border of the recognizable world and its dark alternate. 
a prominent universe by the name of Kalawani. The description of such a destination is an island of dark paradise where every day is arguably torturous, the singer equating it to a very real and personal hell. As the leading lyrics ferry you towards the chorus, you can hear the singer questioning a host of characters from Kalawani, asking things like, why do people have to die? and why she has to experience certain pain, along with why would they intentionally want to cause her harm. The next few lines are completely chilling. The singer bewails her situation as she claims that there's nowhere that she can hide from voices that come from inside. The situation described is steeped in confusion, anguish, and deep torment. The singer speaks about being eaten alive while demons invade her mind, and that there is truly no escape for her, no matter where she goes or what she does. And underneath the verse, we can hear another haunting voice singing along with her as if to remind us of this fact. As she continues singing, she calls out the unfairness of the fabled universe, referring to it as a personal heaven and hell, her paradise lost, her nightmare in heaven. And while this idea may seem to be somewhat contradicting in many ways and confusing in others, it really isn't, especially when we consider what the singer is truly speaking about, which is a mental illness called schizophrenia. This song was originally written in honor of a girl named Janny Schofield. In fact, her story was one that I'd personally followed very closely for many years after seeing a featured program on TV showcasing her life. She, much like myself, was diagnosed with childhood schizophrenia while she was still extremely young. Schizophrenia, for those who aren't familiar with the illness, is a mental disorder that causes the sufferer to hear, see, taste, smell, and touch things that aren't perceivable by others. People with the diagnosis often carry delusions about certain things, experience auditory or visual hallucinations, and can even experience concerning episodes that speak to all senses at once. Childhood schizophrenia simply refers to those who are diagnosed with this disorder at a horrifyingly young age. And for Janny, that was the case. Her world, Kalalini, was a place where many of her hallucinations resided. However, that didn't mean that they remained there. On a regular basis, the characters that she hallucinated bled into her everyday life. She would see cats that fought with her and even with each other, rats that bit her or scratched her when she didn't listen to them, and even other people who continued to bother her as she tried to survive each day. I can say personally that this song is a perfect representation of just how terrifying and painful that that can be. On one hand, she had close friends, interesting pets, and was never alone. Her hallucinations were with her from the moment she woke up to the moment she went to bed. But on the other hand, when she wanted to be left alone, or even struggled to just simply be at peace, those things didn't go away, and the issues persisted until she was repeatedly hospitalized over the course of many years. This song was created to raise awareness not only about schizophrenia as a whole, but about Janie's personal story as well. For many years, I followed her, finding hope in her successes and then eventually mourning her downfalls all the same. Thankfully, these days, she's doing quite a bit better and seems to be coping well with her present life. And that's all I can hope for, for anyone who has schizophrenia. While this song focuses on the darker portions, I would love to see a song that lifts people from the pit of despair that schizophrenia can cause and shows them that there is hope as well. It's not easy to obtain, but it is there if one is willing to reach for it. Well guys, those are just three cases of really dark Vocaloid songs that have super crazy real life connections. While this list may have been disturbing and probably extremely shocking to you guys, I hope that it's also kind of brought to light issues that you may not have heard about before. Issues that will demand our attention if we seek to bring justice to this world at some point and make it a safer, happier place to inhabit. If you guys enjoyed this list, let me know in the comments and I will absolutely consider creating a part two. 
All right, guys, thanks for watching and stay awesome.